Shalom and good afternoon. My name is Yala Dicher and I'm the head of Robus's International Department. I'm happy to welcome you today for a one of a kind, fascinating and very important webinar on the topic of fighting the truth an insider's discussion with lawyers at the legal front lines of Israel. Our discussion today will include information about the ongoing legal fights Israel is conducting around the world. And we will obviously put emphasis on the most current issue the International uh, Criminal Court's decision to open an investigation against Israel on alleged war crimes conducted during Operation Protective Edge back in 2014. Before I introduce to our esteemed uh, panelists, I would like to thank my team at Globus and the Tel Aviv District of the Israel Bar Association for assisting with making this important topic more accessible for Israeli and foreign lawyers. For this session, we are privileged to host two outstanding speakers and true insiders on the topic. First one is uh, Ambassador Daniel Taub, Director of Strategy and Planning at Yad Hanaviv, that's the Rothschild Foundation, former Ambassador of Israel to the United Kingdom, Principal Deputy Legal Advisor to, of Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Legal Advisors to Israel's Missions to the UN, in New York and Geneva, and senior member of Israel delegation to peace negotiations with the Palestinians and neighboring states. Also with us today, Colonel um, Advocate Daniel Reisner. He's a partner at Herzog Fox Neman. He's a partner for public international law, defense, and homeland security. He is the former head of the IDF's international law department, senior member of Israel's peace delegations with the Palestinians and neighboring states, and advisors to all of Israel's prime ministers since Yitzhak Rabin. With me today is our co-host, advocate Jonathan Hoiberger. He's the director of international cooperation at Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs. While the ministry was established in 2006, since 2015, its task is to counter the delegitimization and boycott campaign against the state of Israel in all its form including the legal arena. Jonathan has previously said to me that both Taub and Reisner are his mentors and he will be leading our discussion today. So before we move on to some of the burning questions, I'm passing the stage to Jonathan. Thank you, Yara. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, legal colleagues from Israel and around the globe, distinguished speakers, dear friends. As part of our efforts to counter delegitimization and in close cooperation with our colleagues at the Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, our ministry has set up a legal hub called LNI, the Legal Network Initiative. LNI is a network of 300 lawyers from 40 countries, all dedicated to fighting anti-Semitism and defending Israel from delegitimization, double standards, and BDS through legal means. The network was set up in 2018 in cooperation with the International Legal Forum in Israeli NGO, so that lawyers all around the world will be able to find reliable and up-to-date information about Israel's legal challenges, but also to hear about different opportunities to take a stand and make their voices heard. Especially non-governmental organizations have become major stakeholders in international law in the past two decades. And it has been great to see so many pro-Israel NGOs with a clear legal focus that have joined the network and shaped the legal discourse around Israel and international law. It's important to emphasize that lawyers from the LNI network have a wide range of backgrounds and many work in the world's most prestigious law firms. We welcome legal clerks who've just finished law school and former justice ministers and, and attorney generals alike. Just before the corona pandemic started, we distributed 15 academic research grants and held conferences in South America, Europe, in the, and in the United States, as well as two international conferences in Jerusalem. And you will be surprised how many times lawyers of the LNI network have made a real impact and advocated successfully for a more favorable outcome of a specific legal matter. Thank you, Robos and the Israeli Bar Association for your cooperation and organizing this important webinar together. Ambassador Taub and Colonel Reisner, it's a true honor 
to host you this afternoon. We have an excellent panel because it allows us to look at these questions both from a diplomatic uh, perspective, but also from a security defense perspective. In 2001, Major General Charles Dunlap, Deputy Judge Advocate General of the US Air Force headquarters defined lawfare as a strategy of using or misusing law as a substitute for traditional military means to achieve a war fighting objective. Now, while not everybody will agree with this definition, recent headlines have shown that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not only present on the ground in parliaments or international organizations, but also one that has entered the courtroom. What we're going to do now is to first examine in a broader context, what form this campaign has taken in the past 20 years and what it means to stand at the forefront of representing the Israeli government or the IDF during developments such as the current investigation in The Hague. Thank you, Jonathan. My first question goes to Ambassador Taub. I would like to read out a quote of an op-ed published by Chairman of the Palestinian Authority, uh, Mahmoud Abbas in the New York Times uh, in 2011, that's 10 years ago. Uh, and he wrote, Palestine's admission to the United Nation would pave the way for the internationalization of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a legal matter, not only a political one. It would also pave the way for us to pursue claims against Israel at the United Nations Human Rights Treaty bodies and the International Court of Justice. Now, 10 years after, how would you best explain and describe the efforts against Israel in the legal arena? And can you give examples from your diplomatic experience? Thank you, Yara. Thank you, Jonathan. It's a, a pleasure to be with you and a particular pleasure to be at a forum that brings together so many, so many forces for good. The LNI, the Ministry for Strategic Affairs, the Bar Association, Robus, of course. And Jonathan, what a pleasure to, to, to hear you call, call me and Daniel Reisner your mentor. I have to say on behalf of us, we get extraordinary nachat, we get extraordinary satisfaction and pride from seeing the incredible work that you're doing today. Yara, thank you for the question. I think that op-ed by, by President Abbas was, was very revealing and, and very, very sad because what he revealed then was that his strategy was not to try and advance claims in international organizations for the Palestinians to become a state, but in fact, he said the exact opposite. He said, we want to have the standing of a state in order to pursue claims against Israel. And if you think about it, it it's very tragic. It's an, an expression of sort of visionary bankruptcy. We don't have a positive agenda, our definition is really one that is, that is negative and, and, and hostile. And, and if you think about what, what the Palestinian people most need, it's quite clear that progress is dependent on two things. The first is on, on actual state building, building the institutions of government at home. And the second is eventually to come to the negotiating table and to make difficult compromises. And unfortunately, a dynamic has been created. And I think, sadly, the United Nations has to take a lot of responsibility for this, that a magnetic attraction has been created away from state building, away from negotiations, in order to, the, in order to try and advance these, these real sterile, hostile agendas within the United Nations and other international organizations. It didn't start with the legal institutions. If we go back in time, we can see that these hostile activities really began in the political organs of the United Nations. They started, if you go back to the 1970s with votes in the General Assembly, Zionism is racism and so on. And we know that there's a, there's a sort of comfort zone for the Palestinians in the General Assembly of the United Nations because there really is an, a sad automatic majority for any vote against Israel, where the Arab states, the Muslim states, the states of what's called the non-aligned movements will all vote one way, and all the Jewish states, sadly only one, will vote the other way, and it's a foregone conclusion. Um, that was the situation during the 1970s, the 1980s. What we then saw was an attempt by the, the Palestinian group, as it were, to expand this circle of influence from the political organs 
to the human rights bodies of the United Nations. That's the period of time when we saw what was then called the Commission for Human Rights, what later became the Human Rights Council, become the, the travesty of human rights protection that it is today. More special sessions condemning Israel, more rapporteurs investigating in Israel than every other country in the world combined. And if you think about it, the real victims of that politicization are not Israel, but victims of genuine human rights abuses elsewhere in the world who don't receive the attention that they deserve. But what we've seen, as, as, as Jonathan pointed out, over the last two decades or so, is an attempt to expand this circle of influence still further to the legal and judicial organs of the, of the international community. And, um, and that's happened in part because there have been changes in the nature of international law over the years. We've seen the development of, of principles of individual criminal responsibility. We've seen a rise in the power of not just states, but non-governmental organizations on the international plane. We've seen a speeding up of the process of, 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 of treaty making and so on that have all played into this. But by and large, the move has been, this has been, as we mentioned earlier, a way for a Palestinian leadership to avoid compromise, to avoid the painful necessary business of state building. And it's, it's tragic on a number of levels. The first reason that it's tragic is, of course, that it doesn't help the Palestinians achieve their real goals. The second, I think, Jonathan, the quote that you had from the, from the military man about, about um, lawfare is not quite right, because this is not a replacement for military action. Actually, a lot of lawfare in the Palestinian context goes hand in hand with military and terrorist action. In order to advance claims in international tribunals, the other leg of the pincer movement, if you like, is to have organizations like Hamas deliberately creating extraordinary, extraordinary dilemmas for democracies to bury their military equipment, their terrorist activity in the heart of civilian populations so that they will have a basis for advancing legal claims in international tribunals. And, 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 and that means that it's not just Israelis that suffer. It's that Palestinian civilians who are caught up in this, in this brutal, heartless, heartless strategy suffer. And I think there's one more victim of all of this that we as a group of lawyers shouldn't forget. And that's international law itself. That actually as a part of this strategy, we see core principles of international law being, being um, muddied and actually cast aside. Almost every legal institution that has become tainted with these types of institution has suffered. And legal principles, I think, for example, of, of, of legal statements made by the European Council would say that the, the attacks that endanger the lives of civilians are contrary to international law. Now, now, now Colonel Reisner will know for sure that is not a principle of international law. There is no principle of international law that says that when you are being attacked from the heart of civilian areas, you cannot respond. The question is, do you respond proportionally? Do you respond with distinction? But if you adopt that as a principle, you are really issuing an open invitation to every terrorist organization in the world to set up a shop inside a school or a kindergarten or a hospital. So, so I think that we've seen a dynamic that's very relevant in the Palestinian context but not only. And the fight that we are fighting here is not just a fight for protecting Israel's core interest. I think it's also protecting for the genuine future of the Palestinians. And more broadly, it's, it's, it's protecting core principles that are absolutely vital for every democracy that fights it, finds itself in a fight against terrorism. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Tau, for that uh, overview. Um, that's uh, really uh, fascinating how you put everything uh, in context. And I, I will ask you more follow-up questions on some of the examples uh, you have given, such as these uh, complex, uh, complex combat situations and uh, whether they are being best reviewed in uh, international courts or uh, foreign courts. Now, uh, I'm turning to you, Colonel uh, Reisner. You're not only the former head of the IDF's International Law Department, but also, uh, I would say, Israel's most prominent public international lawyer working in the private sector. Um, how do you assess uh, this development of uh, pursuing lawsuits against Israel? 
uh, and even Israeli uh, companies on the basis uh, of international law? And would you also consider it like the last Israeli government did last summer as a strategic threat? And my final question would be, how would, should it be best uh, addressed on the governmental level? Thank you, Yonatan. Thank you, Yara. And thank you for the opportunity to be here with my friend, a longtime friend, Daniel Taub. As you can see, there was a period in time in the Israeli government that in order to work in public international law, you had to be named Daniel. I think it's <laughs> over now, but you never know. Um, so first of all, let me say something. I want to follow on on uh, Daniel Taub's excellent uh, explanation of the gradual process that the Palestinians went through. Another component to that process is, I think somewhere around the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, the Palestinians and their supporters realized that they would not win this through the use of force. And this is something that they understood together with the Arab neighbors of Israel. And, and that followed the Israeli-Egyptian Treaty of Peace from 79, the Israeli-Jordanian Treaty of Peace from 94. So, the atmosphere was clearly moving against an Arab coalition supporting the Palestinians and winning a, a battle to liberate Palestine, which was the original idea. And so one of the new strategies which they launched in the late 90s, early 2000s, was what we call to try to induce the South African spiral on Israel. And when I say the South African spiral, I mean uh, South Africa, apartheid South Africa, uh, uh, went through a three-stage process. First of all, it started through the fact that the apartheid regime was delegitimized internationally. That moved to international sanctions, and finally, that broke the white South African government. And the Palestinians and the supporters said, we should try to do the same thing to Israel. We should delegitimize the state of Israel. If we delegitimize them, then at some point in time, the normal countries of the world will impose sanctions. And if that happens, something good will happen at the negotiating table or somewhere else. So in the pincer movement that Daniel Tao was talking about is a strategic alternative to a full-scale war. And in that respect, terrorism is now supporting that political uh, 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 avenue, but there is no expectation on the Palestinian side, on the Hamas side, that terrorism will bring a political solution. So it is now supporting the uh, delegitimization process. With that in mind, I want to focus a bit on lawsuits. Um, the first time we encountered this phenomenon was actually 1999. Uh, if you remember when there was an attempt to initiate criminal proceedings in Belgium against then uh, Minister Ariel Sharon for his uh, alleged involvement in the Sabra and Shatila massacre in Lebanon in 1982. And to be truthful, that would have succeeded if our neighbors had not been greedy and had decided to go after the Americans as well in the Belgian legal system. And what happened was because they went after the Americans, the US State Department actually informed the Belgian government that they were going to move NATO headquarters out of Belgium uh, as a result of this lawsuit. And within 10 days, the Belgian government actually repealed the law which gave the Belgian courts universal jurisdiction. So it had nothing to do with us. We were very good, but the reality was the Americans saved us that day. <laughs> and then we went through repeat performances of that in other countries in Europe. There was Spain, there was the UK, and there were others I won't go into right now. But then they started going after companies. And the logic is that if you delegitimize anyone that works in Israel, with Israel, in the West Bank, you are creating a, a, a sort of, of, of a tsunami effect whereby normal companies will say, and I've seen this, I can get an ROI, a return on investment in Israel of let's say 7%. I can get the same return on investment in some Southeast Asian country, but without the political noise. So what would you do? So the idea was to demotivate uh, 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 international business to do business with Israel, well, and at the same time to scare people away. Now, to be truthful, that did not work. 
because they didn't win any case. And they didn't win any case, not just because we are right, because as Ambassador Taub explained earlier, one of the things that our neighbors don't care about is actually international law. They use it as a tool. They don't view it as something important to preserve. So there's no problem in inventing new rules and convincing or bullying people into adopting new rules of international law, especially uh, uh, developed for us, for Israel. That's not the problem. The, the reason we won was that they were disorganized and we were not. And at the end of the day, when these type of discussions reached legal fora, not political fora, professional international judges and lawyers said, you know what, uh, 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 this isn't serious. However, and this is a big however, uh, we do recognize what we call the Google effect. And the Google effect is when you go on page one or two or three of Google and you read the same message, at the end of the day, most normal people start believing that that must be true. So if you go on Google and you type anything related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you get a very one-sided version of that story. And normal people in normal countries, you choose who those are, reading those pages would say, well, everyone is says and everyone knows, so it must be right. And so one of the, I think, successful methodologies that our neighbors have come up with is we may not be right, but if we flood the internet and the world with reports and documents saying Israelis are the bad guys are committing war crimes, etc. At some point in time, everyone will say everyone knows. And by the way, that leads us into our discussion about the ICC later. I'm sure Daniel Taub and I will focus on the impact of all of that very soft and often false uh, 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 publications on, on the ICC itself. But I want to end with addressing the final point you raised, Jonathan. And as you know, this has been a pet issue of mine for many years now. Um, because I served for many years in the Israeli government and then I retired and went into private practice and sort of tried to do the, both at the same time, supporting the government from outside, I quickly realized something which I did not see when I was in government at that time. It was just like you prayed the LNI network uh, the LNA network wasn't established as an Israeli invention or uh, it was established as a response to a similar phenomenon from the other side. Because what we realized, and Daniel Tao mentioned the rise of the NGOs in international law. Well, in reality, uh, uh, while the number of terrorist organizations fighting Israel has not increased over the last 25, 30 years, the number of NGOs dramatically. And what we discovered is that we are facing a net of hundreds of politically motivated, not international law motivated, politically motivated NGOs who have taken upon themselves to create this network of false information and everyone knows. And facing that, we realize that the government is in an ineffective tool. A, because the audiences who listen to such NGOs do not believe governments. B, because it's such a wide network that the government would be hard pressed to come up with an effective strategy to handle each one of the strands individually. And that is why about, I don't know, 15 years ago, we started talking about the idea of creating two things. A, a network of similar NGOs, which will tell the truth and tell the Israeli story. And B, a combination of capabilities between the government and that network so that we could have a synergy. The government has information, intelligence, and experience. The NGOs have motivation, manpower, and are spread out all over the world. And the combination of those two, I think, is the most effective counter movement to the Palestinian uh, 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 phenomenon I talked about earlier. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel, also for your uh, fascinating uh, introduction. Um, we're going to now uh, speak about uh, specific uh, examples of this uh, campaign, and uh, you both have described it as a continuous campaign, more like a marathon rather than a sprint. Maybe it's not really about these small wins in the local court, but the ongoing effort, how you called it, uh, Colonel Reisner, the Google effect of creating a certain narrative where there is um, one villain and one victim. 
um, which I agree with you, Ambassador Taub, doesn't really uh, help um, the, the peace process and the two peoples coming together. Now, two major developments, Ambassador Taub, um, of this uh, campaign, of this effort that has been described as an effort not only to internationalize the conflict, but now also to criminalize the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, the Goldstone Report published in 2009, and the attempt to accuse Israel of war crimes in the context of the 2010 interception of the so-called flotilla to Gaza, better known as the Mavi Mamara. And now I would like to ask you, is a criminal court, a national or local, or are UN agencies best equipped to review the legality and proportionality of complex combat situations? And how do you assess both the diplomatic but also the public relations implications of such cases in the aftermath, in particular, even after such uh, cases have been uh, dismissed. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, so you've highlighted two, um, two particular instances of what we could call lawfare, the, the Goldstone Report, the Palmer Inquiry. And I think those are actually two interesting examples to bring there. In a sense, they're bookends of a dilemma that Israel faces on the critical question of to what extent we should participate in proceedings like this. But before I mention them, I just want to mention one other thing following on from what uh, Daniel Reisner said. You know, in, um, in a military conflict, an asymmetric conflict, a country like Israel is at an extraordinary disadvantage. It's at a disadvantage amongst other things because any civilian anywhere is a success for the, for the, for the terrorists, the, the combatants on the other side. But Israel has to be very precise. And I think in terms of the lawfare campaign, there is something similar. If you think about what the strategy of lawfare is, it's really spray firing. Any legal body is fair game. If you think about the range of potential frameworks we can have international frameworks. We've seen, we haven't spoken about it, but Israel's security barrier in the International Court of Justice. We have the ICC. We have what Daniel was talking about around Daniel Reisner, universal jurisdiction, boycott, sanctions, and so on. And we, in response, need to be very precise. We need to, to, to have respect for the legal institutions and so on. Um, I think when we talk about the networks, and again, both you, Jonathan, and Daniel talked about the importance of international cooperative legal networks, we do have an advantage, um, which is that we can also have a positive agenda. And I think one of the things that's very, very important for us to do when we get together is not only think in a reactive, defensive way, but to also think about what is the positive agenda, both for Israelis and Palestinians and other parts of the world, how you know the, the international legal network that we were able to set up some 15 years ago, 13 years ago, had as part of its goal, how do we help countries that are seeking to establish international law frameworks and so on? So I think that's very important. But to go back to your question, Jonathan, you know, when there is an international legal initiative in relation to Israel and Israel and the Palestinians, the core question that repeats itself is, do we participate? Do we cooperate in this initiative? And there's a tension here. The tension is on the one hand, we want to raise our voice. We believe we have a strong case. We want that case to be heard. On the other hand, so often these initiatives are such distortions of what you might consider any fair principle of objective investigation. We don't want to by participating give legitimacy to something that maybe otherwise wouldn't have it. How do we navigate in that complicated tension? So I'll say that I think the default position of the state of Israel over the years, and I think rightly so, is to cooperate. I am doubtful whether there is another country that has actively cooperated and today cooperates the occasions, international initiatives and so on and so forth, as Israel does. But that doesn't mean there are not cases where a red line or several red lines are crossed and both for our own dignity and for the dignity of the institution itself, we have to draw a line. And I think Goldstone and Palmer, although these are only two examples, are good examples of that. 
you know, when I think about what are the red lines, I think there's three sort of benchmarks that are very, very indicative. The first is, is the mandate. The second is the membership. And the third is, if you like, the modus operandi. What is the way in which this organization chooses to operate? In the case of the, the Goldstone inquiry, um, this was a, a result of a resolution that was adopted by the Human Rights Council, a horrendously one-sided resolution that again, we talked about spray firing set up a number of different initiatives. This was one of them. The mandate was clearly prejudgmental. It talked about Israeli violations before there had been any investigation. There was no mandate to investigate any possible terrorist activity on the other side. Justice Goldstein tried to argue that there was, but it wasn't, it wasn't there. And if you stop and think about that for a moment, you know, if you were to take any medical operation and describe it without describing the disease that it's trying to deal with, it would always look like an assault. And that's precisely the situation that Israel finds itself in these types of framework. In terms of the membership, we looked for any genuine military expertise on the committee, and there really wasn't. There was an Irish soldier, but it was not clear that he'd ever seen combat. There were members of the committee who had actually signed on to public protests and petitions against Israel before they had taken on this judicial function. And the modus operandi was also bizarre, perhaps influenced by the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa. Justice Goldstone thought he should have public live broadcast hearings. But if you think about a judicial proceeding, you're literally encouraging grandstanding, you're encouraging emotive, unsubstantiated, you know, uh, accounts that Israel has no opportunity to respond to. And, and I have to say the report that came out, I think really justified Israel's decision not to cooperate. It was so clearly one-sided. There was no, not to mention the fact that a lot of Israel's positions and facts that were already put out there in the public space were deliberately ignored. Um, I think when we talk about the membership, it was quite clear that this was a report that was written to a large part, not by the members of the committee, but by a, a, um, an entrenched, very, very um, one-sided staff based in Geneva. I mean, one of the things that <clears throat> I remember struck me as being almost comic, was that every time in the report, the terrorist group that is Adin al-Qassam is mentioned, there was a little footnote to remind you that this terrorist group, it wasn't called the terrorist group, was named after a Muslim prophet who looked after children. I mean, what type of psychology actually goes into the writing of a report in that way? I think, you know, if we were to give up on international law, it's really helpful to have a corrective model. And I think the Palmer inquiry is a very good example. Jeffrey Palmer, not only a former prime minister of New Zealand, but a genuine expert in maritime law in his own right, a committee that had a mandate that was genuinely to investigate all sides of a very complicated issue. And maybe in parenthesis, it's worth mentioning something else. One of the reasons that Israel finds itself in these situations is that in a way our conflict is a beta site for new types of really perverse terrorist competent activity. And the idea of a flotilla that is armed but is masquerading as a, as a humanitarian initiative is one of them. And one of the things that you'll see in the history of Israel is that often the first time that these things happen we don't have all of the answers, we're struggling. And the situation of the flotilla was precisely one of those where our first engagement was not entirely successful. And it took a while for the military forces and the intelligence forces to come up with more effective responses, which they did. So they were genuine issues that needed to be discussed. Um, the membership of the committee included a representative of Turkey and a representative of Israel, Yossi Chikanova. So it was clear that in the internal discussions, we would have a voice. And even though the inquiry didn't accept everything that we said, I think at the end of the day, the, the legal findings were very, very supportive. They recognized the, the legal nature of the maritime blockade. They recognized, unlike Goldstone, unlike, unlike the International Court of Justice, that Israel genuinely has a right of defense against terrorist attacks emanating from, from the Gaza Strip and so on. Um, so, um, so at the end of the day, I think we don't expect perfection from an international body. The best is the enemy of the better. But we do 
expect that a judicial organ will be trying to reach, reach the truth and not a political result. And in those situations, I think our default position is the correct one, is that we should cooperate, as I said before, both in our own interests and in the interests of international law. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel Tao. But then, Aizen, maybe you want to quickly also address the question of whether to engage or not. Uh, one of the also very prominent cases is the one of the barrier uh, where the Israeli Supreme Court actually um, approved the legality of the barrier subject to, to some changes, and the International Court of Justice in 2004 held it to be unlawful. Now, I think if the judges were to come together maybe today, maybe they would find a different, um, get to a different result because we see that the barrier is effective in almost pre uh, preventing 100% of uh, suicide bombing inside Israel. But at the time, I mean, they didn't even uh, visit the sites or took uh, very uh, concrete um, steps to, to understand the full implications um, from a court. So how do you see this question of engagement and, and non-engagement? So first of all, I, I fully agree with Daniel Taub that the default position should be to participate. And I'd like to give three quick anecdotes on this so that you can understand how Israel actually fulfilled it. So first of all, if I remember the number correctly, uh, Operation Defensive Shield, which was the operation which also brought about the uh, Goldstone Commission, uh, if I remember correctly, there were a total of 16 international fact-finding and uh, investigation committees established globally. The International Committee of the Red Cross, the U United Nations. I, I lost count of how many different organizations uh, uh, set up committees of, to find out what had happened because the Palestinians kept saying Israelis are doing bad things. If I remember the number accurately, and I'm not sure I do, we cooperated with 15 out of the 16. In other words, the only one we did not cooperate with was Goldstone, but that was the only committee you heard about. Again, that's the Google effect. So that's anecdote number one. Anecdote number two about the Goldstone committee is I had already retired from government when the committee was set up. And one day I was at home, I was a practicing private lawyer advising the government from outside. I got a call from the United Nations from a Scandinavian person who introduced himself as an ambassador so-and-so. And he told me that he was working with Justice Goldstone to set up the hearings of the committee. And he said that uh, they wanted to invite me as a witness, uh, uh, apparently because I had read in one of the Israeli newspapers that I had been critical of the Israeli military on one specific issue and they liked the idea that the former head of international law was critical of the Israeli government. Now, because I knew the government had decided not to cooperate, I said, I'm not sure I am free and available. But then I called up the Israeli government, the highest levels, and I told them, you know, you want to hear something funny? The Goldstone Committee called me up and said, do you want to appear? And I said, of course, I'm not sure I can make it. And say, you know what, that's a great idea. Why don't you appear? And then we don't have to appear, but they'll, at least hear our views. So I called back that uh, ambassador and I said, you know what, I think my calendar will allow it. And he said, fine, uh, the hearings will take place in Amman, Jordan in two weeks, are you available? And I said, I am. And then I said, I just have one small question. Are you arranging the security detail or am I? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, no, because in Amman, Jordan, they are the headquarters of several different terrorist groups and I'm relatively well known to those groups. So. So because of my military background, so we always travel with a security detail, uh, either the Jordanian or the Israeli is fine. I can handle it from Israel if you don't want to. And then there was silence on the phone. And then this, I think, Swedish ambassador to the, uh, in the United Nations said the following sentence to me, which I think is very indicative of where the world is. And he said, Mr. Reisner, I have to share with you that this is the first time I've ever thought of an Israeli being threatened by an Arab. So. And I remember, and by the way, at the end, I flew to appear before the Goldstone Committee in Geneva because uh, Aman Jordan went out the window and I appeared before them for two hours and another two hours with the staff which was actually writing the report. And I actually answered every single one of their questions on every single one of the issues that they published later. And 
uh, Jonathan, you won't be surprised when the Goldstone report came out, I immediately did a control F to see where my name was mentioned. And there I was, I think it was footnote 489, <laughs> where they quote the only point I made, which was critical of the IDF, but on every single other issue that I had answered at length for hours, they wrote, we never heard the position of the Israeli government. So, you know, to put that in perspective, when Daniel Taub says that that was a kangaroo court, <laughs> he didn't say that, but he meant it. It was an absolute kangaroo court. So I think we are right in that we should, as default, engage. But Daniel Taub is absolutely right. We have to filter out the legitimate and, and well-meaning against the enemy attack. And when you see the enemy attack, you probably do not engage. Uh, thank you, and, and I think uh, you both highlighted the, the, the issue that the, the answer is really in the detail, looking at the institution, looking at the process, and uh, um, also uh, making sure that, that, that there's the right um, ability and forum to make your arguments uh, known and bring them forward. Jonathan, we should probably just mention, in case the listeners aren't aware, there was a fairly important article that was written a number of years after the event by Justice Goldstone himself, where he recognized some of the major failings of, of his report, of the inquiry, and said, if I knew then what I knew now, the report would have looked very different. Unfortunately, yes. that was too late to help us in other institutions, but uh, but I think it's worth remembering. hundred uh, percent, and thank you for, for um, uh, reminding our, our listeners about that. We're turning now uh, to our next uh, topic, maybe the main topic of our discussion, uh, the ICC. These uh, three letters that have made headlines in uh, recent weeks, um, when I studied international criminal law, I must admit around 2004, this was rather an esoteric field of study. You were either a criminal lawyer aiming for a career in a particular law firm with high profile uh, clients, a white collar crime, or you uh, studied public international law and I dreamt of a career as a diplomat or government legal advisor. And to quote some of my friends, this was a field of study with no practical relevance, only academic in nature, and with zero job uh, prospects. Now, I'm happy that um, they weren't right, and um, there is, especially when you're an Israeli international lawyer. Ambassador Taub, maybe you can explain what, what the International Criminal Court is. You were, in fact, one of the few Israelis that participated in the conferences setting up the court, and maybe you can just take us back in time a little bit and and tell us more about the negotiations. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. I, I don't think I can take you back right to the beginning because the idea of the court was mooted, actually sort of the, the Treaty of Versailles or just after the First World War. So I, you know, I, I wasn't quite around then. And it came up again, of course, after the Second World War where there was a, a tremendous recognition of the need for international criminal justice. It was put on cold, on, you know, put on ice for many decades primarily because of the Cold War, you know, when you had this 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 uh, standoff, there was simply no way that it could it could take off, and it really started again, gathered steam, you know, in the late '80s, the early '90s, um, and actually in a slightly strange way, I think it was Trinidad and Tobago that was concerned about drug issues that actually put it back on the international agenda. There was a, a ILC, an International Law Commission report, and so on. And, and the idea of the court was very simple. Until the point where the court was established, when major war crimes happened, basically the only way the international community could bring the perpetrators to justice was through setting up an ad hoc tribunal after the event. What happened in Nuremberg, what happened in former Yugoslavia, what happened in Rwanda. And the feeling was that this is simply not an appropriate mechanism we should have as part of the architecture of the international legal community, a permanent war crimes tribunal that is capable of addressing the most significant, a, a, a significant uh, violations of international criminal law. Um, and Israel and the Jewish people were very supportive of that idea. Who, who like the Jewish people, doesn't realize the, the tragedy of genocide, the tragedy of major war crimes, and, and first of all, Jews after the Second World War were very much in the forefront of campaigning. 
and Israel also. So Israel participated in what were called the PREPCOMs, the preparatory commissions that were discussing the International Law Commission statute. Um, but what happened as those conferences went on, it became clear that this institution wasn't necessarily developing in the way that the founders had hoped. There were a number of areas of concern. Some of them were structural. It seemed that the prosecutor had extremely broad powers that were not restrained. Some of them were substantive. It was troubling, for example, that terrorism was not going to be included as a crime in the statute of the court, but responses of a democ democratic state to terrorism could be classified as violations under this court. But for Israel, I think the, the greatest warning light and, and the issue that finally decided you know, Israel's position was the attitude to what was called transfer of population or settlement building. And here, this was not something that started with the court. It was a long-standing process. Uh, it was, again, another part of uh, anti-Israel Arab strategy to take a provision of the Geneva Conventions from 1949 that talked about the transfer of population to occupied territories, thinking about what the Germans had done in Czechoslovakia and so on in, in the period of the Second World War. Uh, the Arab group had actually already shifted that particular provision in the protocols of the Geneva Convention in 1977 to try explicitly to target Israel. And now they saw another opportunity to try and to use it as a, as, a, as a hook in order to try and catch Israel. It was, it was both problematic in itself, and more broadly, it was an indication of how the court could be harnessed for political goals. Um, Israel tried to indicate to other states some of these concerns. I have to say, I think, you know, this was a good example of an international legal initiative where a lot of the impetus came from non-governmental organizations at the time. And I think states themselves, particularly the United States, were relatively late to wake up to what were the security implications. And it was only at a later stage that, for example, the Pentagon woke up tried to draft what it called the elements of crimes to try and capture back some of the basic necessities and so on. Um, the result of this was that oh, Israel the, the, the conference that finalized the statute of the court, which was in Rome in 1998, um, and where the vote on the court on the statute didn't allow you to actually object to any specific provisions. It was a take it or leave it vote. Um, Israel really had no choice, but actually to decide against an institution that it had hoped would end up very differently. And the, the most poignant moment of that conference was the head of our delegation, a wonderful man, Judge Eli Natan, a, a, a true humanitarian, a human rights activist, a Holocaust survivor himself, stood up and, and made a speech explaining that despite his hopes for the court. I actually just read it again this morning. So I'll just give you a line or two from his speech. He says, Mr. President, we still maintain the hope that somewhere good sense will prevail and the ICC, which is established as the result of all our hard work, will not become just one more political forum to be abused for political ends by an irresponsible group of states at their political whim. We continue to hope that the court will indeed serve the lofty objectives for the attainment of which it is being established. That was a sadly prophetic warning by Eli Natan. And I think, though, one of the things that marks out Israel's position on this, unlike some other initiatives, which we think are, 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 maybe, are maybe void ab initio, who are very problematic from the outset, this is a really good idea. It's something that the international community could really benefit from if only it was conducted in accordance with uh, genuine principles of objectivity, neutrality, you know, and judicial integrity. Um, thank you, Ambassador Taub, uh, Colonel Reisner. You have also taken part in these discussions after the, uh, is after the Rome conference and uh, shaping Israel's uh, decision at the end not to join the court. Um, what were your concerns at the time? I remember you explained to me once there's the issue of providing information without it being exposed to a large audience. There are some judges on the court who have not held a criminal trial in their careers, just to mention two. 
Um, and I, I very much agree with you, Ambassador Taub. I think what the world uh, does not need is another political institution. Um, now, uh, Colonel Reisner, uh, maybe you can take us also back in, in time and, and share your views and whether your fears have actually uh, come, have become a reality looking at the current proceeding. So thank you, Jonathan. So first of all, let me say something which may surprise people. Um, our recommendation after the Rome Statute was finalized was not to say no. It was to say, let's wait and see. Because our recommendation was, if this court does manage to fulfill its in historical role and potential, it will be a good thing for the world. It will be a good thing for international law. It is something Israel should be a party to. But the point was that we saw all the risks that Daniel Taub just mentioned, and a few of those that you referred to. For example, uh, and, and I just focus on one of them. Every time we conduct one of those medical operations that Daniel mentioned earlier, uh, we usually do it on the basis of secret intelligence. It's not on Google where the head of Hamas is operating and planning his attack. You need very deep and sensitive intelligence. Now, the problem is when they then come after you and say that attack was an illegitimate attack on innocent civilians, and you need to prove the fact that A, the target was not an innocent civilian, B, that you took all the precautionary uh, 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 measures possible to minimize the risks to, to uh, uh, civilians in the vicinity, you will need to share highly sensitive military information. And the problem was we looked at the structure of the court and its secretariat and the way that everything was built, and we suddenly realized that there was no way we could provide that information to the judges, to the staff, or to anyone else without it being automatically leaked to the terrorist organizations themselves. So with that in mind, we realized that that was just one big hole, but there were several others, procedural and substantive, which raised significant concern. Now, to be truthful, I think the primary concern was, would it become a tool of politics? And all the rest were, I would call them secondary, but really important concerns. So our original recommendation to the government, when I say our, I mean the military, was let's wait and see. By the way, uh, I don't know if you remember this, Daniel, uh, 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 but, but I actually lost the vote in the cabinet. I went to the cabinet uh, um, to convince the cabinet not to sign the Rome Treaty. And there was a smaller forum of the cabinet with Prime Minister Ehud Barak, which decided not to sign, but then it was demanded that it would be the wider cabinet. And at the end, it was decided to vote against the Prime Minister's view and to sign because- your, your work was done by the American government because well, actually, later- uh, yeah, Yes, but, but Daniel, but what, what people right. don't know, the reason why that happened was the State Department pressured uh, the Israeli Foreign Office to sign together. <laughs> so what happened, it took a change of U.S. government to change the U.S. Uh, US mind, and then we followed suit. That's right. But we actually signed the Rome Statute originally because of American pressure, which mm -hmm. just goes to show you uh, how things change, where now Israel and the U.S. are the two primary countries who are not members of the court who actually uh, are involved in these discussions. And both so, countries also under investigation. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and so... I think in some respects, this was a, a prophecy of doom that we saw coming, but we were truly hoping that the train wreck would not occur. But because of the processes that Ambassador Taub and I explained earlier, this was too juicy a target for the Palestinians and the supporters not. And therefore, it was just a question of time before they would try to assert the ICC into the to the, to the role, but I have to say something else. The ICC prosecutors, the first two prosecutors, were all too willing to play along for a variety of reasons I won't go into right now, but let's just say that this was fertile ground for an anti-Israeli uh, uh, initiative. And therefore, I think in retrospect, unfortunately, we were right, uh, that this is currently not the international court the world deserves, it's the international court that um, interested parties have managed to develop to promote many of their political interests. Um, speaking about the current case, just to maybe give some context uh, to our listeners, 
Now, at the end of 2019, the ICC prosecutor asked from the pretrial chamber uh, for a ruling on the scope of territorial jurisdiction uh, in Palestine. She herself was of the view that the jurisdiction of the court includes Gaza and the Uh, to assume that war crimes have been committed uh, by Israel and Palestinian armed groups. Um, with regard to Israel, uh, in particular in relation to the 2014 Gaza conflict, also known as Protective Edge, and uh, the building of so-called settlements in the West Bank. Um, Israel, as is well known, uh, rejects the court's jurisdiction uh, because Israel is not a state party to the ICC, has not consented to its jurisdiction, and Palestine is not a state that could delegate jurisdiction to the court. Not only Israel, but also seven ICC states parties, Austria, Australia, Germany, Hungary, Czech Republic, Uganda, and Brazil, and a large number of leading academics, non-governmental or professional organizations, also such as the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists and the Israel Bar Association, have filed amicus curiae briefs um, on this matter and against the court's jurisdiction in this case. Now, on February 5th, the pretrial chamber of the ICC, in a ruling 2-1 with the Judge Kovach dissenting, confirmed the prosecutor's view that Palestine was to be considered a state party to uh, the ICC under the ICC statute, and that the court's jurisdiction included Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. As a consequence, the prosecutor on March 3rd announced the initiation of a criminal investigation. Ambassador Taub, now, if this court was established to act as a court of last resort with the capacity to prosecute individuals for the most heinous crimes, and I, I quote, that shook the conscience of humanity when national jurisdictions were unable or unwilling to do so, how do we get to the situation that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict one of the most complex territorial, historical, religious, ethnical, and cultural conflicts of the world is now being under a criminal investigation at The Hague. And how do you assess these developments? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I think in a sense, this is, we could put it in a sense, a climax, a coming together of a lot of the trends that we've been talking about in this, this discussion. The, the political pressures within the, the UN and other international organizations, the, the irresistible attraction of dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is some kind of poisoned chalice. The, the you know, international actors find it so hard to refuse, but at the end of the day, it really causes havoc and undermines their integrity so often. And I think we see it here the, the, the opinion that was written by the prosecutor was, um, was hopelessly political. And you know, if you think about it, it really undermines the very need for the court. The international community does not need another political body. The only justification for the court is if it's a truly judicial organ, but it seems to be trying to have it both ways. It's trying to have the authority, the influence, the teeth of a judicial organ, but it operates basically in a political way. And, and there are many, many problems with the, with, the, with the prosecutor's opinion and with the majority decision of the pretrial chamber. But I would say for me, the, the fundamental problem, the, the one that goes to the core of it, is that on the crux issues, it doesn't reach a judicial decision but it basically outsources the decision to political organs. It basically says on this question, you started off the discussion quoting President Abbas saying that he wants to be a state in order to, to pursue legal claims. And on that issue, it says, we're not going to examine it according to the legal criteria of statehood. We're not going to examine it according to the agreements that have been reached between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. We are simply going to look at the General Assembly of the United Nations and resolutions that have been passed <clears throat> by the automatic majority that. We don't need a judicial organ to parrot political, political decisions of political organs. 
And, and if we stop for a moment to think about what are the implications of adopting that approach, first of all, it simply bolsters what we talked about earlier, this message to the Palestinians that you don't need to engage in compromise, in engagement, in state building. You can just run off to political organs. It undermines agreements. I mean, why should Israelis continue to reach agreements with Palestinians, handing over powers and responsibilities, when these are then going to be abused as a basis for making claims that undermine the very principles of those agreements. This I could actually also have effect for other parties. Why should other international state parties? I think that's absolutely right. And, and simply on terms of the agreements, you know, there's a debate amongst international lawyers whether you have a principle of equity in international law. But I think there is an issue of coming here with clean hands. You know, in a sense, the jurisdiction of the court is based on the legal jurisdiction of the Palestinians under the legal agreement, the legal jurisdiction, which in theory is delegated to the court. But under the agreements, Israel has the right to request the terrorist, terrorist combatants be arrested and transferred to Israel for trial. As far as I know, and Daniel may be able to correct me, some 80 applications like this were made by Israel. And to the best of my knowledge, not a single terrorist was arrested and transferred to Israel for trial. So here we have sort of willful neglect of those core obligations, and yet an attempt to try and build on them. And you, as Jonathan, you said, this is a message not only for Israelis, it's a message for, for terrorist organizations around the world that, that, that the use of these, you know, we call it this pincer movement, this really cynical abuse is... is is actually that pays dividends. I think there is some cause for hope. Um, and I think one of the things that I hold on to is that, that um, the presiding judge in the pre-court tribunal that, um, was Peter Kovach, who you mentioned, who he didn't just dissent. He dissented in the most forceful way. He said that he, he basically admitted that we are seeing a politicization of the court. He said there is nothing in the statute of the court or international law that justifies the decision of the majority and the prosecutor here. And I think as long as there are voices like that within the court, you know, our hope is that those court, those voices will have the upper hand and the court will sort of refine its soul as a genuine judicial organ. And just to follow up on that, how do you um, assess the decision of the prosecutor to initiate uh, um, a criminal investigation now? even though in the summer there will be a new uh, prosecutor and her decision not to open a criminal investigation into other situations and also against the background of a, a wider uh, review report that spoke about um, the importance of um, uh, the allocation of resources and, and preference with regard to the investigation. Sure. Uh You know, I, I'm not a mind reader. It's really hard for me to understand what is going on within the mind. It's, it is rather odd that the prosecutor, knowing that so many critical decisions relating to the conduct of this proceeding are going to have to be made by her successor, should try and plant a stake in the ground now to try and influence it. You know, questions put forward that relate to, to different agendas and approaches. It's far, far be it from me. To, to try and, and relate to it. But I think you're also right. It's interesting, we mentioned Justice Goldstone before, who had something of a change of heart in relation to his own report, but he was the chair of a, an expert review inquiry into the conduct of the International Criminal Court. And anybody that realized it's that, that the prime concern for the court at the moment has to rebuild its own flagging reputation. Professionally, after 20 years of operation, exorbitant amounts spent to only have five convictions, you know, for, for serious war crimes. Um, beyond that, you know, the, the litany of, of professional failings, and not just professional failings, the report, and, you know, people can read it, you know, talk about abuse and harassment uh, uh, within, the, within the structures of the court. You would think at, at a time like this, the primary goal of the court's leadership would have to be to try and restore the flagging reputation of the court and not to take it in, into muddy waters where it's quite clear that it's, it's entering political territory and not judicial territory.
Thank you, Ambassador Taub. Uh, one last question uh, for Daniel uh, Reisner. Um, Daniel, it has been reported in the media that Israel has been officially uh, notified of the prosecutor's decision and that uh, we were giving a month to decide on how and whether to respond uh, to the prosecutor's notification. Given your experience, maybe you can explain a little bit about the different considerations that would uh, could play a role for making a decision and how this may be dealt with on the governmental level as we speak. Uh, thank you, Yara. Um, first of all, let me say that following on uh, Daniel Taub's earlier comment, Israel is now in the uncomfortable situation of being between a rock and a hard place, and I'll explain. On the one hand, as I said, our default response is usually to cooperate, but we don't cooperate when it's obvious that the process is tainted. And there is absolutely no doubt that the prosecutor the, the current prosecutor and her process appears heavily tainted. Um, all you need to do is read Judge Kovacs' incredible dissenting opinion, where he actually says that the prosecutor bases almost all of her positions on principles of soft law and public opinion and not on international legal principles, which is an incredible criticism from a senior. He was, remember, he was a senior judge on the panel towards the prosecutor. And that, by the way, criticism is shared by most international lawyers who have nothing to do with Israel. I mean, the prosecutor has taken the court away from the realm of law into the realm of politics. And once you do that, going back is very difficult and that will probably be one of the challenges for the new prosecutor. But saying that, if Israel does cooperate, and, and let me first explain something about the procedure. The, the letter which was sent out is a letter which gives the receiving country the opportunity to say to the prosecution, it's okay, we are investigating the matter, wait until we come back to you with a result. And this is based on the principle of complementarity, because as we earlier said, uh, the court is only a court of last resort. So if a qualified national authority is investigating and if required prosecuting events, then the court has no jurisdiction. It's not that it can decide, it has no jurisdiction. Now, of the four alleged war crimes which the prosecutor has identified, two fit that uh, 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 criteria. What are the two? One, the alleged war crimes in operation uh, in, in, in 2014, uh, as a second, the alleged war crimes in 2018 and 19, when the IDF uh, responded to the mass riots and demonstrations along the Gaza fence. Now, both of those have been under Israeli military criminal investigation. And so Israel would be very interested in making sure that the prosecution, the court know that Israel's very robust military a criminal justice system has been reviewing all of those cases. And I want to make it clear, even if you investigate and find that nothing has been done, as long as you did it seriously, that precludes the court's jurisdiction. However, the third crime associated with Israel is a crime of settlement activity in the West Bank. And on that, Israel has no defense of complementarity because Israel does not think it is unlawful. So it has never investigated it criminally or otherwise. And therefore, if Israel were to respond to that letter, we would have to respond probably only on those two issues, thus in fact, clearing the path for the prosecutor to say, even Israel didn't stop us from uh, uh, initiating an investigation of the settlement activity. And therefore, even if Israel wanted to cooperate, and I'm not sure the government will want to, uh, um, it's in a rather problematic situation. But I do want to say two additional things on this. Uh, first, I think it's important to understand that it's not sure that the investigation is really going to take place. But not for the reasons you think that the, the new prosecutor, etc. They actually finished the prosecution six months ago, the investigation six months ago. You see, They've been investigating, or for want of a better word, that's what they call it for the last five years. They already have testimonies, hundreds of pages of evidence, 
Everything the Palestinians and the supporters sent them, they already have. That evidence already exists within the court. The only piece of evidence they don't have is the evidence from Israel. But theoretically, I'm quite positive that if they even collect no piece of additional information, they probably have things that they believe are sufficient to justify moving forward without doing anything else on the ground. Now, that is a huge issue. Because if, for example, Israel does not cooperate and does not allow them to come in, which is probably going to be the result if I can prophesy the future, it doesn't mean that a, a Zoom will be stopped or, or any other of the variety of technological means we've become expert in in the last year. But secondly, they already have volumes upon volumes of testimonies which are uncorroborated, uh, have no factual base, it doesn't matter. They have enough and they believe them. Uh, and how do I know that they believe them? Because the prosecutor said that she has them in her report. So one of the challenges we face is, I think they think they already have the case. And anything they do now is to add additional layers of evidence or counter evidence. But that is the real challenge for the Israeli government right now because everyone knows it. Um, I think the final two points I would like to say is first of all, when you read Judge Petr Kovac's descending opinion, one thing made me really sad. It's how uh, what we call post-truth entered into the international legal arena. And I'll give you two examples. He talks about the fact, and this is not me speaking, this is the senior judge at the pretrial chamber. Uh, he says, uh, every, the, the prosecutor said there is a Palestinian state. And she said that because Palestine was recognized as a non-member observer state in the United Nations General Assembly. And he says, but I have seven different countries, many of them supporters of Palestine. I mean, Brazil cannot be viewed as a pro-Israeli country in any format. Okay, who say, when we support a Palestinian state, we do that politically, but we don't think a state of Palestine really exists. He even quotes uh, uh, Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, who talks about it in future sense. He quotes everyone. And he says, apparently the only people who think Palestine is a state is the prosecutor and is the prosecutor. And the other thing is he does the same thing for the Arab states, many of which have already made peace with Israel. Uh, the prosecutor bases her position. She says, I know that seven serious countries have said there is no state of Palestine, but the uh, Arab League took the opposite position. Now the Arab League has a lot of member states. So she sort of placed them in as, in, as a parallel uh, universe. But interestingly, Judge Coburn says, well, I actually read the statements by each of the individual Arab states and none of them recognize the state of Palestine. So the organization of the Arab League submitted the document to the court without any basis or relevance or backing of any Arab states. And the prosecutor said that countermands Germany, Austria, uh, uh, Czech Republic, etc. right. Now, what that shows us is that it is now okay to tell truth one to audience one and truth two to audience two. And people will accept that because you're telling the truth. But the reality is we are in a post-truth world where you can present different versions for different audiences and it will work. And so I think the greatest issue for me, in addition to the fact that we now face this significant challenge of how to treat this investigation, uh, 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 because there's almost no right move. Everything we'll do will have negative consequences. I'm also very sad that the prosecutor Ben Suda and her staff have now formally taken the International Criminal Court, which had the chance of becoming the world's premier criminal court into becoming what I call the International Court of Public Opinion. And, and, and the moment you move it to that side of the equation, it loses all legitimacy and she may have destroyed one of the more important initiatives of international law for the last 100 years. Friends, our webinar is coming to an end and we cannot have asked for better experts on these questions. I would like to thank my co-host, Jonathan Hoiberger for leading this amazing initiative. And of course, our expert ambassador, Daniel Taub and culinary Daniel Reisner for taking the time to participate. I would also like to thank the Tel Aviv District of the Israel Bar Association.
as mentioned, Israel's efforts vis-a-vis -vis the international legal arena and the ICC do not end with this webinar. On the contrary, if you would want to get involved and join the Legal Network Initiative and to get regular updates, then please reach out to one of the email addresses shown below. This is your opportunity to make an impact and use your legal skills um, for defending of Israel's legitimacy around the world and to make the case for Israel inside and outside the courtroom. You're also welcome to a special website created for this purpose. You can see the email address here below. Thank you very much for taking part and participating in our webinar and we'll see you next time.